Welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. We're back, episode 165, the night of uh, June 10th here as we continue to get into the summer. You know what? Football seems like it's a long ways away. We still got some decent storylines for you tonight. No guests, just me uh, rambling on a little bit tonight, if you will. But like I said, some good storylines from across um, all really three of the levels of football that we cover tonight. So we're going to start with a sweet new NAIA field coming to a team out in the Frontier Conference. Um, a, a new look uh, on the turf for Montana Tech that we'll get to very shortly. We've got a D2 team that is hitting the portal heavy right now a team we've talked about quite a bit on this show that we'll talk about in a little bit how about a division three safety turned wide receiver inking a deal in the nfl with the colts and then uh a, a kind of an interesting follow-up from last week we talked about the hiring process at uh, new mexico highlands we've got a follow-up piece on another one of the coaches that applied for that job as an naia coach he got fired for interviewing for another job that one is if nothing else, very a very interesting one at that. So I'm excited to talk about that. Um, and finally, the start of some stadium features. I want to go through at least through the rest of this summer while we have a little bit of slower things and just highlight some of the best stadiums around the country, uh, D2, D3, NAI. We'll get through a lot of that. But as always, you watch this episode on YouTube. Don't forget timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen there. Also available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts in the descriptions. Look in the description. It'll tell you where you want to go for all of our different pieces of content. For tonight's episode, be sure to subscribe, follow the socials. Appreciate you guys all tuning in. Let's start at the NAI level. Montana Tech, really a powerhouse team that has a long story tradition and history out uh, in the Frontier Conference there. And Montana Tech, the Ore Diggers, this is their current stadium, at least uh, you know before this new turf gets gets in there. And you can see kind of a, a pretty basic look right there. Uh, Bob Green Field there, and it's uh, black end zones look nice. Nothing too crazy or, or out of the box, right? Just a pretty generic stadium. I like the, the striping you have. It looks like a little bit of alternate, like dark green, light green. Now, here's a better shot of their stadium. They got a nice uh, hill mountain. I don't know if you call it a mountain right there in the back. Um, so a pretty cool setup and their home side, I believe is built right into that hill, which you've seen a lot of at a lot of these stadiums. But again, that's a more recent picture. This is the new set of turf going in to Bob Green Field. And uh, it says it's going to be installed this month. This is a tweet from Montana Tech Football. As soon as they're done with camps, they're ripping up the old in with the new. And uh, this is the new look for the ore diggers. I love this. Really clean. Once again, not anything ridiculous. I do love, I think an underappreciated part of it is like the solid black for the uh, the player coaches box, whatever you want to call that on the sideline over there. I think that is really nice as opposed to just lines. But how about the big logo front and center? Not anything too flashy, but massive. Absolutely massive. And then again, I think the biggest, probably most obvious, like really cool detail is you have this like mountain on the left there that slopes down into the middle of the field. That's clean. Something that you just, I don't think you see a lot of, like intricate details like that in the field. And I don't know what's stopping teams from doing more creative shit like this because I think we just see uh, a lot in the same of the plane. It looks like they're getting away from the striping, though, of that like alternating dark and light green, which is uh, unfortunate. But um, I don't know why we don't see some more creative uh, things happen with these teams and they, get, and they get these new pieces of turf. So shout out Montana Tech. I love that for them. I think that's really exciting. It'll be a cool addition to that stadium. Last year, they were 7-4. and four. They beat a Division II playoff team. In Central Washington, we know the run that uh, the Wildcats went on. The Wildcats won a playoff game last year in D2 over a solid Western Colorado team at their house. And uh, this Montana Tech team, I, I think, you know, I think I know we on this show gave Central Washington a little bit of shit for that, but this team was solid, man. They had two wins versus top 25 teams. They split against a really quality Carroll squad, and um, they're going to do the same same as in play them twice uh, this year. They open up with Georgetown, too, so that's an exciting out-of-conference matchup for the Ore Diggers there. Um, just a lot of really good things happening over there. Like I said, a lot of history, a lot of uh, different exciting pieces to that program. But we will move over to Division Three, and we're going to talk about a guy today who played safety in his career at Ithaca College over there. He had 11 interceptions, 119 tackles, and he was an AFCA second-team All-American selection for the Bombers. And Derek, I mean, you, you think of that, you think, okay, obviously the dude is going to do the same thing. You Typically, you don't see the safety converted to corner at the next level, probably at that same position. Uh, he just signed a deal with the Colts. He signed as a wide receiver, which is really, really neat. Um, and that, I think it says 
all you need to know about this guy because uh, he really is Mr. Do-It-All. The fact that you can do that uh, at a small school in college, come out, have, well, take a look at the pro day numbers here in just a minute, but have the impact he did on the field, go out and show out at pro days in front of some of those uh, directors of scouting, get in front of those right sets of eyes, and they have confidence to bring it in for training camp. I will say, this was his third training camp. He camped not only with the AFC champions and the Chiefs, but also with the NFC champions reigning from this past season with the 49ers. So it'd be interesting to talk with him and hear how those two experience prepared him uh, experiences, excuse me, prepared him for this invite training camp with the Colts. Because again, as someone who like coming from a small school, especially, I'm sure that first day, first week even is such a culture shock and there's so many things going on for him to have those two experiences under his belt. Now they didn't seem to work out, which um, is too bad, but again, he, they obviously like something because he ended up with the Colts here, but I would I'd be very curious to hear how those two previous experiences potentially prepared him more so for this chance in Indianapolis and, you know, how that bettered himself at, at getting a spot there with the Colts. Here's the shot of uh, him actually signing his deal. And if you read here, it sounds like he is the first bomber to sign an NFL contract since 1967. The only thing cooler than that is that he's repping a Demon Slayer shirt while he's inking the deal. That is awesome. And uh, I was already a fan of you, Derek. I'm very much so a bigger fan now because we got Tanjiro on the t-shirt there. That is sick. Um, for you non-anime people, I mean, get with it. But um, sweet photo, sweet t-shirt, just a sweet story all around uh, for the the safety and I guess the hybrid just freak athlete out of uh, Ithaca, New York. And if you wanted to take a look at some of his numbers from his pro day, which I believe was at uh, Buffalo, if I'm not mistaken... Here is a look at some of those numbers. And again, you look at this and the RAS score, the relative athletic score, was a 9.46. That's out of 10, people. I believe that is out of 10. So that is really solid. And you can see his size and a lot of his measurables, they really do stack up to Division I caliber competition, to pro competition. Um, over six feet, he's six foot two, right? And uh, 215 pounds, like, those are things that the way he moves along with that size are things that you just don't get from a lot of prospects at any level. Almost a 40-inch vert over a 10-foot broad. 40-yard dash was a 4.55. Hello. Pretty solid shuttle time right above a 4. Then the 3-cone was under 7, which is something you always look for in these type of guys. But, um, you know, I've, he had posted some comparisons of him to uh, like a Kyle Hamilton is something like out of Notre Dame that uh, I think he sees himself as maybe a pretty good comp uh, there in terms of size and, and skill and athleticism, which is obviously a pretty freaking good one. So a lot of great things coming here um, for him and, and excited to follow his journey with the Colts and, and whether he ends up staying with the Colts, whether he ends up being a practice squad guy, wherever, if he bounced around another team, he's done it. He's made it. We're pumped for him. So that is really cool. Let's talk about a squad now and the D2 scene that has hit the transfer portal pretty hard. We've talked a good bit about Lockhaven, the Bald Eagles, on this particular program. And shout out to Coach Mulrooney and Chris Collier, who uh, Collier, who joined us uh, on the show not too long ago. Honestly, really enjoyed having them on. And you know, we had them on not just because they're great people, because they are, but this program is coming off a season in which they had their best year in over 40 years. Right? They haven't had a winning season since I believe 1940 something. Right? And they're a play away last year from going 500, and again had a, a what is compared to their history, really good year. But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about how they've hit the transfer portal and what they've been doing with this recruiting class. Now, Lockhaven, PSAC squad, for those of you who don't know, signed 42 on National Signing Day. They did graduate 25 from last year's roster, so there's a good amount of space cleared up. I would assume with that comes a good chunk of scholarship money to kind of dole out to a lot of these guys, and you'll see here who they're bringing in exactly. Um, I guess let's just start with that. I mean, let's look at some of the guys they are bringing in here, just scrolling through their Football account. Here's a big one. How about a tight end from Florida Atlantic? Rise McDonald. That's a seems like a kind of a big deal to get him down at the D2 level uh, at a place like Lock Haven. Keep going down. It doesn't end. Deshaun Evans. We'll talk about the quarterback situation I think, a little bit more in depth, but I guess I can, I can allude to it right now. They're bringing in three transfer quarterbacks into the fall training camp. Deshaun Evans is one of the three, and his situation, obviously, you see the logo on the helmet there from Notre Dame College, who unfortunately shut down recently. He is joining uh, Lockhaven. He only has one year of eligibility left, I do believe. 
He is one of the three quarterbacks heading into fall camp 24 with the bald Eagles. Another man here coming from Bloomsburg, and we'll talk about that uh, PSAC connection here in a sec, but uh, Nadir McLeod is a guy making that transition over, and I guess I'll just touch on it right now. When you look at a lot of these guys, we'll go through the list. I don't know if I've ever seen so many guys that have been recruited to come play at an in-conference school. That's something to me that is very interesting. They've got guys from, here's Bloomsburg, also from Millersville, Clarion, Mercyhurst, who's formerly PSAC, Shippensburg. Like, you go down the list. You're getting guys that, quite honestly, you matched up against all last season. And Coach, uh, you know, Coach I'm over there, he had talked about, um, Coach Mulrooney had talked about how you, know, you play against these guys and they score touchdowns and they make big plays against you. I think the back of his head, he's just taking note. Like, okay. Okay, yeah, I remember those guys. And then you see, I'm assuming he's, you know, sitting like we do on X, scrolling through. Oh, hit the portal. Yeah, I remember that guy. Yeah, let's go ahead and get him. Let's go ahead and and get all these guys. (laughs) I love that. I mean, it's a great attitude and mindset. I just don't think you see that very often. So it's it's cool that they're able to do that. And then, again, feels like a kind of a big deal here. How about running back K.J. Howard from Ohio University? Listed as a running back here. Believe he played most of his snaps at wide receiver for the Bobcats there in the MAC. So, I would assume that has a little bit to do with how they plan to utilize him in the backfield offensively at Lockhaven. But once again, a D1 guy coming out of D2 level, obviously a, a great athlete and, and should be a good prospect for them. Here's another quarterback coming in and Jackson Ostrowski, and he is coming from the University of Rhode Island. So once again, we're talking that D1 connection, guys who probably aren't seeing the amount of playing time or whatever it is, the Division One level, want to come and just be the dude. And you know what I think is, is special about that, and you might ask what makes Lockhaven a good spot for that, you look at last year, that's the best example that you probably have. Chris Collier, who we had on the on the podcast here, like I said, just recently, he's a guy that played at the Division One level, didn't get maybe the carries that he wanted, comes to the peace stack, he's got one year left, and he's promised, he's like, hey, you're going to come in, you're going to be the dude in the backfield for us. You're going to be the bell cow. And he was the bell cow, right? This dude's averaging over 20 carries a game, and he's toting the rock for them. Ends up being, uh, I believe, a first-team All-American. He was on D2 football.com's elite 100 list. Uh, it racked up basically every accolade in the book, first team all peace sack and all, all kinds of things. He now gets an invite to go compete uh, with the Baltimore Ravens, signs a UDFA deal with the Baltimore Ravens. I'm sure if you've seen that, if you follow us on any of the socials, but I, I say all of that because Lock Haven has proven in very recent history, hey, if you're a guy, you think you're a dude, you are a dude at the D1 level, you're just not getting that opportunity. Come here. We're going to have a spot for you. We're a program on the rise. We're trending in the right direction. You're going to play also against really good competition. We've heard numerous guests on this show talk about the PSAC and the depth in that conference. And I think when you look at Division II landscape as a whole, between the MIAA and the PSAC, I don't think there's other conferences that have the same depth. Depth, Excuse me. The GLIAC has a really great top portion. Right, you talk about GV and Ferris. Then you got a couple teams like Davenport and Sag, you know, Michigan Tech, whatever, that are kind of in that conversation. But GV and Ferris kind of run that that league. You look down at the Gulf South, right? You've got West Florida, you've got well Valdosta, you got Delta State. But then what? You know what I mean? It kind of drops off a little bit. You look at the RMAC. It's kind of the kind of the same deal. I feel like between the MIAA and the PSEC, just my personal opinion, those two conferences probably have the best depth in all of Division II, and that there are teams from top to bottom that can come out and win that conference, right? I think this past year, a great example of that could be in the MIAA. How about the year Emporia State had with Braden Gleason, Gleason, excuse me, under center? And uh, on the flip side of that, in the PSAC, think of a team here like Kutztown, who maybe wasn't picked above squads like Shepard, who has had a lot of success. Slippery Rock is always at the top, and you have other teams that are always in the conversation. Um, Lockhaven is certainly going to be one of those teams very soon. So I, for me, that that playing against great competition at the D1 level, or D2 level, excuse me, and getting quality film, to then show to the respective eyes, the recruiting coordinators, whoever at the NFL level, is big. So they're getting a lot of these uh, Division I caliber guys. Jackson is the second quarterback of which they have dipped into the transfer portal and they're bringing to uh, Pennsylvania down there. But keep moving through here. And you look here. How about another D2 guy? On the defensive line, Jamel Flowers, he's coming over from Virginia Union. Really stacked defense over there that they had, and they're hoping for a really big year. They're uh, ranked in the top 25 in the preseason, so another big get for them on the defensive side of the ball. Here you go. PSAC squad, Shepard University, tight end Jake Yelton is making the trip over. And then uh, I believe, yeah, we got a couple more. This is uh, some of the high school guys here um, that you can see, but there was one more guy I wanted to – Highlight from their first round. I'll uh, find. I'm gonna save you the scrolling, but they've got uh, his name's William Pickett, 
And uh, he is a quarterback coming in who actually originally, if I'm correct here in doing my little internet research, uh, went to Cortland out of high school. The D3 team, the reigning national, defending national champion, he went to Cortland, was there for, I believe, two years, and uh, then made his way over to uh, Nassau Community College, I believe, NCC, and now is getting another opportunity with the Bald Eagles at Lock Haven. And I'll find his uh, little announcement video here if you just... Bear with me. There's so many. Like I said, I mean, they brought in over 40 guys in National Signing Day. And, yeah, that's a lot of guys. But, again, for them, there's a great balance of guys that um, – this isn't all high school guys, right? These are guys that are coming in. These are um, a lot of grad transfer type guys. This is uh, his little announcement for uh, Pickett here. That's uh, their other quarterback they'll be bringing in to fall camp. And that's where things get really interesting, right? Because these guys are all guys who have playing experience, obviously, and they're coming from very different situations. I mean, you couldn't probably have three quarterbacks with more different situations than these three guys. One of them is coming over um, from Notre Dame College, right? And uh, he's got one year of eligibility left. His school just shut down. The other one right here is kind of just like looking for another opportunity coming out of the community college scene, looking for another chance to play ball. And then finally, you've got a guy coming down from the D1 level who's looking to be the dude and to finally get the reps that he feels he deserves. So I would assume heading into fall camp, not that there would be any animosity or anything, but you're going to have a great quarterback competition down there in Pennsylvania. We will uh, certainly follow in and see how that pans out. But the story that I think I was actually, I don't know if I was excited is the right word to talk about it, but definitely interested uh, to talk about is the story of an NAIA head coach who was terminated, fired, dismissed, kaput, uh, shortly after interviewing for a Division II opening. And I'm reading some some blurbs from the, the Football Scoop article here, but uh, the basic gist of this, and we talked about it last week on the episode, New Mexico Highlands, they do their interview process. As part of the interview process, they have a public forum where there are three identified three finalists, the committee did. They brought the three finalists in and they did individual respective public forums with each finalist, right, individually. They came in, the public was available to come and attend, and they could also tune in via Zoom. We talk, it's just kind of interesting. We don't haven't really seen that too much in college athletics. For them to do that was kind of neat. Uh, we'll see if that shakes up anything. But one of these three finalists, Darren Jackson, he was uh, the head coach at Sterling College. It looks like he was one of the three finalists that came in for this public forum. And um, as he said, he was very transparent with his institution and letting them know that he would be interviewing uh, for this job. And if, if you've been around college athletics in almost any capacity, especially at these levels, especially in the sport of football, where you're, everything is so result driven and you have guys that are trying to make those steps up the ladder and, and jump to a different level, which for him would have been a big jump to a division two squad. And, you would know that it's not uncommon at all for these coaches to interview for other jobs, right? As someone who I've served on a search committee for a, head, a new head coach, and you see a lot of guys that are current sitting coaches, sometimes that's successful programs, right? That happens more often than you think. It, it could depend on so many different factors and things in their life, whether it's football or outside of football, right? And family and other deals. So he goes, he has an existing head coaching job, but he interviews for the head coaching job at New Mexico Highlands, uh, he was just informed by the administration at Sterling today that he was being terminated. Because I, would, I don't know if they came out right and said, hey, this is why, but you put apples to apples, right? You know, two plus two is four. Like, <laughs> that's why. Right? That's why they're getting rid of him because he openly interviewed for this. Now, this is the statement from Coach that he posted. Coach Jackson posted this on Twitter as uh, his announcement to, I think, the greater football community. He says here, I'll read for you guys listening. Hi, everyone. I wanted to take a moment to reach out and inform you that 15 days ago, I interviewed for the head coaching position at a D2 school in New Mexico. Immediately following this process, the administration here at Sterling College decided to terminate me from my position as head coach effective immediately. Throughout this interview process and my return to Sterling, I made it adamantly clear to the administration that I was not turning my back on Sterling and was going to hear out the opportunity presented before me. I hope you understand interviewing is commonplace in this profession, and I owed my family the due diligence of interviewing. Players, I have striven uh, to help grow you into the men that you were designed to be. I wish you all the best. You have my number if you need anything in the future. Thanks for the opportunity to coach you. It was a privilege. Signed, Darren Jackson. Man, like that, that hurts a little bit, 
a lot of bit. And I, I think it's something that it's easy for me to play like what he called armchair quarterback and just and like throw stones at a, I don't know what the hell the expression is, but like basically what I'm saying to be so detached and not, under, you know, be there. But with the information we do have available to us, what a shitty move. Like what? Just there's, I wish there was a, I had a more politically correct way to say that, but what a shitty move on their part. This guy who at least claims, and I'm going to take his word for it, was very transparent throughout that entire process. It's not like he came into the office one day and blindsided his administration by saying, hey, I might take this other job, by the way, right? He goes through this process admirably and amicably, I think is the better word choice there, and goes about it the right way and is rewarded by saying, hey, pal, you no longer got a job here. Get lost. Which, by the way, he also did not get the position at New Mexico Highlands, that job went to Kurt Tofasau, um, who, again, a very deserving coach in his own right. But I just wanted to, I'd be curious to hear your guys' thoughts on this one. Like, if you comment down on, on this video or, you know, wherever you're listening to the podcast, DM us on, on the on the socials. But what do we think here? I, I think for me, it's just scummy. Like, this just does not feel right. From, a, from someone who works in college athletics right now, this is brutal. You have a guy that, you know, I, I have no idea what his record was at Sterling. Was this something where maybe they had some past issue and they were just waiting for a potential reason to get rid of this guy? I don't know. I'm not an internet sleuth. I don't, I don't really go through and look at those things. I'm not in the building. But for me as an outsider to look at this and you have, as an administration, I feel like you have some kind of duty and some kind of due diligence. I mean, to like to just kind of respect the wishes of your staff. And this is something that happens so often and football is not the only sport affected by this. A lot of coaches, there are there people too, and they have to go out and look for the best uh, opportunities available for themselves, whether that's at your school or not. I think you owe them that much respect. And so for me, that was kind of ridiculous. I did not like that one bit. So again, we're only, we're really only hearing his side. I didn't pull up a, a release from the school or anything. So I'm not going to like, totally 100% bash anybody because, again, I don't know all the details, but damn it, from the details we got, this sucks. This stinks. Ah, Shorter episode tonight. We'll finish this one out, though, on the first of what I'll just call the Stadium Highlight Series, man. Tonight, we're going into the jungle, and for those of you not familiar, that would be Pittsburgh State. The Gorillas down in uh, not Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, by the way. Pittsburgh, I believe, Kansas. They've got themselves quite a stadium down there. It is, uh, I think, pretty widely known as one of the best in all of Division II football. Take a look at the jungle right here. How about it, man? Really sweet stuff. Technically not named the jungle, although it is uh, a pretty epic nickname. The technical name of the stadium is Carney Smith Stadium, and uh, this is one that has been around I mean, forever. And you get actually a sneak peek at some of the other facilities here. Uh, this is just from the Pitt State website, weight room and meeting rooms and some of the other things. But I wanted to show off those first couple clips of the weight room. We'll take a closer look at the, the stadium itself here in just a second. But the stadium, man, groups came together. Like when I tell you this stadium has been around, I mean this thing has been around for more than a century, right? I mean, we're coming up right on that. In 1923, faculty, alumni, and community came together in 1923, excuse me, to provide the funding for this stadium. That is incredible. And again, get you one more look here at the, at kind of the overview of it. That's awesome. I can tell you right now, it did not look like this in 1923, but that's when it came together. It was at, at the time a 5,000 seat stadium. And uh, this is a team, Pittsburgh State, once again, for those of you not familiar, this is the winningest team in Division II football history. Over 725 wins. And in their 100 and what, 13 or 115 years of, of whatever, they're averaging almost seven wins a season in that time. And for again, anyone who knows college football knows how freaking ridiculous that is to average almost seven wins a season as a top caliber Division II or just a NCAA football team in general. Here's a cool time lapse uh, from 2011 on game day against uh, William Jewell, it looks like. But this is something that, man, like this stadium is there are a couple other ones in Division II that certainly rival it, but this is this is part of the top, right? If we're doing like, you're, we should do a tier list, honestly, of all the T D2 stadiums maybe in the country, this would be a, probably an S tier, potentially A, either A or S tier type of stadium, right? Like this is right up there with all the best. Um, and looking, reading more into some of the information, 
This has gone through, obviously, a lot of different renovations. In 2001, they had a $5.7 million expansion project. So that was the second level of seating you see there on the left side. Um, you got 16 luxury skybox suites, elevators, new restrooms, concession stands, ticket booths, renovated locker rooms, the whole deal. It also added 2,300 seats to uh, bring up the capacity to about 8,000. And then in 2006, they came back, put $2.6 million onto that, added uh, eight luxury skybox suites to be added in addition to the west side with more elevator access. And uh, they finally got a big-time video board in 2008, 1.7 mil. Holy cow. It's 2,800 square feet of, quote, vibrant video and scoring updates. It remains the largest university stadium video board in the state of Kansas. That's incredible. That is incredible. This is a team and a community that is so invested in football and this program. And for anyone, I think the best example, that's probably the gorilla walk they do pregame. They walk out and do the uh, statue. I'll pull it up here for those of you not familiar. But that's just not something that you see so often at the D2 level. Like, um, I know a lot of uh, the Tiger Walk or like other things, the Clemson, like a lot of... Um, Big time Division One teams will try and do that, uh, and they do. But Division Two teams, you don't usually see this level of commitment and buy-in from Division Two uh, communities the way they support their programs. And here is, I'll, I'll mute this. Um, here is a good video. I, I don't know what the resolution on this is going to be. This is a this is a Facebook find right here. This has not been vetted, uh, but we're throwing it up anyways. This is a look at the Gorilla Walk down in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Look at the amount of people showing up to this thing. You can see in the kind of the bottom right corner there, that's the gorilla statue. Come by, give them a little nux, keep it moving for the fellas there, fully suited up. Got the pet band, parking lot, tailgates going on. Just an absolutely outstanding crowd and atmosphere. That's what makes Pitt State different, man. This stuff is incredible. You just don't see this at the Division II level um, almost at all. Like they're almost in their own league at this point when it comes to uh those kind of things i have a couple more photos here i think of the uh here's a good here's a good couple ones of the uh gorilla walk here i'll pull this up but again man i think this all goes into like the game day atmosphere and other things this is a great shot of the Gorilla Walk pregame, and you get a good idea of that size of that statue right there. It looks like they even got a stage for some live music, other things going on. They're doing it right. The Gorillas are doing it right down there. Uh, they host Ferris State in a battle of two top five teams in week zero this fall, August, I believe, 28th or 29th. That is going to be electric. They got two national championships in their program history. Like I said, winningest football team in D2. The Pittsburgh State Gorillas, man. That's... Who else to start the stadium series than Pitt State? There's a lot of great ones to come, but uh, that'll be all, man. That'll be all for this episode. Thank you all for tuning in. Do you see that fly that just went by my face? I'm about to end this episode and go smack the shit out of that thing. Um, thank you for tuning in. For D1 Rejects, I've been Kobe Manzo.